We are at the Charlevoix Public Library with Edith Gilbert, longtime Charlevoix resident, and for working on our project, which is the Charlevoix Oral Traditions Project. And Edith is participating with Charle Memories of Charlevoix and her memories. And I am Judith Ivan, Assistant Adult Services Librarian, and our videographer is Rick Pierpont from Harbor Springs, Michigan. So welcome, Edith, and we'd like to have you start by telling us first when you came to Charlevoix and what your memories are of the resort life of Charlevoix. Oh, I love to talk about the resort life. <laughs> I came to Charlevoix as a bride in 1940, and at that time my in-laws lived at 217 Park Avenue, and we had a home at 210 Park Avenue. And uh, it was quite a shock for me because I came from Beverly Hills and the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I heard all about Charlevoix which, with the pines and the birch trees and the lakes, but I, I was still surprised by the different lifestyle of a summer resort. And uh, one of the first surprises I remember clearly was uh, we came up, I guess, in June. And uh, I was over at my in-laws, and uh, my father-in-law was there, Sam Gilbert. He had was a cigar manufacturer. and. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dutcher called on him, and Mr. Dutcher had the grocery store, and they sat down in the living room and they chatted like old friends, and, and my father-in-law wanted to know everything that happened in Charlevoix that winter, who got married, who died, who had babies, and Miss, it was a tradition that Mr. Dutcher would come in and they'd sit down and chat and maybe have a cigar, and uh, keep up to date with what was going on in Charlevoix. And in those days, there were uh, wagons with horses, and they delivered groceries, and they delivered, they had a, a I think Mr. F I forgot his name, Edwards or Frank, or the florist would come with his horse and buggy and deliver flowers. And the ice man would come, and he'd bring uh, blocks of ice and put them in the ice box. And uh, it, it was uh, very interesting at that time. Everybody came up with a, uh, their trunks, and uh, we would. A lot of people came by train, and uh, the or maybe the trunks were shipped up by train because I remember going down to the railroad station and P.R. Ross would have his, his wagon and his horses and they would put the trunks on the wagons and then they would bring them up to Park Avenue and then they would carry the trunks upstairs and put them in our bedroom. And everybody had their own monograph trunk. And uh, then of course in the end of the summer they would come and take them away again. It was those heavy trunks, I don't know how they did that. But uh, life was entirely different and we had the most wonderful telephone operators, live operators, and they would uh, tell you what's playing at the movie and they would give you the uh, ba uh, basketball scores at the game and they would even track you down if you had a long distance call. They knew where everybody was because they used to have fun listening in, but nobody minded. Were there party lines or did you have a private line? Private line. You had a private line. Okay. Well, I know that there was a gambling casino. In oh, town. my goodness. Cooks. Cooks. So. Well, See, that was, uh, I came up here in 40, and the war broke out in 41. And that's the ta era that Charlevoix was booming because people couldn't travel to Europe or South America or the Orient anymore. So everybody who used to travel would come to Charlevoix. And Charlevoix was booming, and Cook's was booming. And uh, I, uh, I used to go to Cook's 
usually Thursday night, which was Cook's Day Out, and Saturday night. And Saturday night, uh, people got dressed up. But Thursday, with long evening gowns, and tuxedos too sometimes. Uh, but Thursday night was not dressy, and I wrote about Cook's in detail in my book, uh, Summer Resort Life. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, which might be of interest to you, the local people were not allowed into the Cook's Gambling Casino. And the reason for that was Mr. Cook's didn't want anybody local to lose money. He didn't mind taking thousands of dollars from the Michigan <laughs> Avenue and the Belvedere and the Chicago Club crowd. But he didn't want any local people to lose money, so they were not allowed in. There was a doorman, Mr. Poole, who allowed those who were in and kept anybody he didn't know out. Okay. And what kind of gambling did they do there? Oh, that was interesting. It was a very elegant place. They had a formal dining room with a dance floor and a raised a, a stage for a live string orchestra. They had palm trees around. They had marvelous Italian food and they came around with carts with dessert, carts, and uh, the only people that were allowed in the dining room were Dr. Saltonstall and Bob Bridge and uh, the Hawleys. But they were not even allowed in the gambling room. And the gambling room was completely separate and they had nothing there but uh, roulette tables and one crap table. Then they had a separate room for people who just wanted to play cards. It was sort of a club, in a way. Did you ever lose any money there? My limit was $100. <laughs> if I lost $100, I stopped, and if I won, a hundred dollars. <laughs> you still have to. You're supposed to keep going even when you win. I know. I don't know how to gamble. <laughs> so, in terms of the evening gowns and the that women wore, can you describe what a couple of them might have been like then? Oh, they were very beautiful, long, silk and chiffon. And uh, everybody had fur capes, mink stoles, and the men had white tuxedos. It was a wonderful era. And uh, there was a lot of partying. And uh, everybody had a set date for a party. I remember one gentleman had a set date in August the 1st, Saturday, for his annual party. And nobody could have that date until he died. <laughs> and I remember another family who had a Gapers catering in Chicago and they had the Gapers come up with their trucks and they did fabulous parties and of course there were no restaurants in those days. There was absolutely no restaurants. The only place we could go was uh, the Red Fox Inn in Horton Bay. And that's where we went for anniversary and birthday dinners. And uh, uh, the, they had a lot of, um, they had a lot of boarding houses on Dixon and Michigan. And for instance, Mrs. Houston had a boarding house on Michigan Avenue. And it was very popular, and the finest people stayed there. It was a very high-class boarding house. And occasionally, people would entertain there. She'd have maybe 20 or 30 people for dinner. And that's the first time I ever had tomato pudding, was at Mrs. Houston's. I remember that clearly. Oh, not at the Red Fox Inn, but at Mrs. Houston's. Right, right, right. Yeah. Then the Red Fox it had it, too. But the first time I had it was at Mrs. Houston's. Yeah, it's luscious stuff. <laughs> she was a great cook. 
Did you remember um, the Argonne Supper Club, or was that in the 50s? Oh, I have to tell you about that. When I first came up here, I, we drove by the Argonne Supper Club, and I said to my husband, why don't we ever go in there? He said, oh, no. He said, that isn't the kind of place for you to go. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't go there till after it was taken over by new owners. And it used to be kind of a rough place, I guess. I don't know, because I never went. But then later it became a very nice, fashionable place when they had all the shrimp you could eat. It was originally called the Argon, you know, because the people who started it had been in World War One. Yeah. They were veterans. Okay. That's that's a good connection. Yes. What else would you like to tell us about resort life? Well, let me see. Uh, I remember going to the Charlevoix Hospital, and they had no elevator when it was up on the hill. Mm -hmm. And they carried the patients up and down stairs mm -hmm. on stretchers. Wow. I never got over that. And uh, the Bridge Street had grocery stores and hardware stores, and there was an Italian fruit man who had wonderful fresh vegetables, and uh, there were Indian women uh, selling beadwork and uh, quill boxes. It was entirely different in those days, and uh, everybody knew everybody. There was the Polly K store, and that was wonderful, a very fashionable store. They had the finest carriage trade, and they had a darling little children's doll, like a house for children to go in and play while the mother shopped. <laughs> I remember that. Do you I was, really? I was a kid, yes. Oh, it was so yeah, cute. it was wonderful. It was a great store. My mother... And they a, had uh, Buicks, chauffeur-driven Buicks and Cadillacs and uh, all those Lincolns and fancy cars on Bridge Street. And the chauffeurs were all in full-dress uniform. And uh, I read in one of the old couriers they used to even have a chauffeur's ball at the uh, beach hotel. Wow. And uh, the, uh, there was a lot of help that came up from uh, the people who came here from St. Louis and Cincinnati and Chicago and as far away as Atlanta. And uh, they brought all the help with them. And uh, the black help all had their own club where they could socialize and play music and sing and dance. Do you know where that was? I don't know. I, I don't know. It was out somewhere. But it was very popular and very well-run place. And then the White Help, they would be given, uh, people would give them their boats to take out on a Thursday or a Sunday. And everybody tried to make their life as pleasant as possible. What do you remember about the Venetian Festival? Do you have um, any particular thing? It wasn't as fancy as it is today. It was just one night. One night? Yeah. Did you ever, you and your husband ever enter a boat in the We parade? always entered our boat, and we always okay. decorated our boat, and that was a tremendous job. I know one year it took us a whole week. Uh, there were five or six of us. Everybody in the family worked on decorating the boat. And one year we had a hula theme, Hawaiian theme, uh -huh. and it... Uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was just a one-day affair, which, in my opinion, is enough. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Hooker's Horses. Now, uh, when I first came up here, I told you there were uh, wagons and horses, and Hooker's Horses used to walk across the bridge. 
and then he had a place um, at the on the north side, just uh, at the end of Michigan Avenue, and he had a ring there, and the children would ride the horses. And I remember take, going on horseback with Mr. Hooker down the hill there to the beach, and we rode along the beach with, on horses along the. Uh, Water line where the sand was hard, but then they somebody complained about that, and that was the end of it. Oh, so that didn't last very long. No. What was the relationship between the people who came for the summer, the resorters, and the locals? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know about other people, but my husband and I had a lot of local friends and they entertained us and we entertained them. And that might have been because we spent more time here than most other people. We were here for two whole months, not just a couple of weeks. And we would come up in the spring and fall before and after the close of the season. And we had a lot of local friends and we looked forward to going to their parties because in those days, in the 40s and even 50s, was before television and people had to entertain each other. And we used to play charades and games and play, dress up. And I remember one time they had a treasure hunt and we just, they just made fun all the time. And of course, I, I admit there was a lot of drinking. They loved Corby's, and that's what everybody drank, and they got pretty high sometimes, including my friend Tommy Loeb. But he was interesting. I said, Tommy, how can you drive when you're so drunk? He says, I never go over 20 miles an hour. <laughs> he doesn't go very far either. <laughs> and, there was a wonderful relationship. Uh, we used to have a lot of good times. The Bridges, the Hollies, the Neffs. Uh, there were uh, a lot of people, a lot of people. We had a lot of fun. What was the castle like in there? The what? The castle in the early 40s and 50s. Well, that was the Loeb estate. Right. And of course, we were all friends with the Loeb's, and I remember Ernie Loeb, he was such a fine man. He served on the hospital board, and um, we all loved, loved them. I thought one of the things I could mention is that when that movie came out, uh, Compulsion, they didn't show it in Charlevoix, as out of respect to the family. And uh, they were very warm and very friendly and very generous and worked hard for the community. Did you know any of the Indian families that lived here at that time? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. Later, much later, I think it was in the 60s, I, I interviewed Jay Oliver, but uh, they kept to themselves pretty much. When did you actually move here full time? We moved here full time in 1960, 62. That's when my husband built the lodge. And uh, that was an, another interesting episode. Uh, you see, they uh, in the beach hotel was burned and had to be torn down, and the inn hotel had been condemned years before, and there was a hotel at the Belvedere Resort, and I happened to have been in there one time, and somebody said to me, "Oh, what a pity it was torn down." Well, they have no idea what those hotels look like. They had. A bathroom at the end of the hall. They had no closets. You hung your clothes on a hook. They had no telephone in the room. They were wooden places that just had outlived their time. And uh, 
So the, it was torn down. And so there was no place for people to stay. And my husband, I don't know where he got the idea, but he always wanted to have a motel in Charlevoix. So he got together with Earl Young and uh, des uh, designed this uh, the lodge. Now Earl had already built the weather vane, and so we incorporated that motif in the lodge. Uh, and uh, everything was okay. The lodge turned out very nicely. I think it's still in that lovely place. But they got into a little controversy. For example, in the lobby they had the menu of the Weatherway restaurant, which was fine. But then people who stayed there weeks said, isn't there any other place to eat besides the Weatherway? So my husband put in the menu from the Argonne and the menu from the Grey Gables. And Earl had a fit. He didn't want any other menus. I mean, they got to, you know, bickering over silly things like that. And then Earl decided to, I think my husband bought him out or something, and uh, Earl decided to build the uh, weather vane. The terrace. The terrace. The terrace, yes. Okay. Which was fine yeah. because Charlevoix was growing. And it needed more space. Right. Very good. Well, when did you become so involved with the art center in Petoskey? I know that was. Been well, a big that was when we came up here in the 60s. In the 60s. Okay. Because it, this was a cultural desert, it was just awful. There was absolutely nothing for me to do. No place for me to go. My husband wanted to move here. I didn't. And um, I, it was boring. 